In 1916, a new generation of faster, more maneuverable Allied fighters appeared, which were to challenge the Fokkers. A pioneer among this group was a fast little single-seater biplane called the Newport 11. This was flown by the American volunteers of the Lafayette Escadrille. Because it was so compact, pilots nicknamed it the Bebe. With a top speed of 156 kilometers per hour, it was faster, tougher and more maneuverable than the Fokker Eindeckers but it could still not fire a machine gun through its propeller arc. The gun is mounted on top of the wing because it didn't have any kind of synchronizing mechanism. The gun couldn't fire through the propeller arc, it had to fire above it. You had to fly the airplane with one hand, you had to fire the machine gun with the other, and then you had to use your third hand, I guess, to replace the machine gun drum. Despite its awkward gun, the superior speed and maneuverability of the Newport 11 and other aircraft of 1916 allowed the Allies to dominate their German foes. In February 1916, the Germans launched an offensive on the French fortress city of Verdun, a key position for the Allies. If Verdun fell, the Allied lines would be severed, a potential disaster for the French and British. In desperate fighting that took place over Verdun, and later that year at the Battle of the Somme, the Allies had changed tactics. Instead of the costly method of sending lone reconnaissance aircraft over enemy lines, they now dispatched flights of three or four fighters to hunt down and destroy German aircraft. You gang up on your opposing numbers, so uh, you'll try to get three on one and blow the other person out of the sky. We have some very fascinating accounts of some of the fighter pilots at Verdun. Uh, this is a serious battle to the death, uh, both on the ground and in the air. And one of the early French fighter races, a fellow by the name of uh, Albert Deillain, landed one day after an aerial combat with the Germans and his mechanic observed that his helmet, his goggles, his face, the upper part of his airplane were all covered with blood. And Durian just matter of fact, factly replied, I shot from very close. Air combat was becoming more complex and more brutal. He had been within 10 meters, in other words, 30 feet of the German two-seater that he shot down and had put about 25 bullets into both of the crew members. And he was very pleased with his accuracy and he said it was delicious to descend after that combat. The year-long battles at Verdun and the Somme resulted in well over a million killed, wounded or missing. The aeroplane, as a fighting weapon of war, had come into its own with new technology and new ways of fighting. The British and French, for a brief and critical time, had closed their airspace to German observation. With the Germans unable to see crucial movements behind the enemy lines, the Allies had held off perhaps the greatest German offensive yet. In these battles, the American members of the Lafayette Escadrille proved to be reckless and headstrong in their pursuit of the enemy. The Americans' aggressive style resulted in nearly 200 kills over the coming months, but 63 of their own pilots were lost. Their commander, Captain Thanault, had worried most about 27-year-old Victor Chapman, the fearless pilot who was first to fly out to every fight and always the last to return.
it was a war of attrition. It was kill or be killed. Now, in the early days of the war, you could salute your enemy. If he ran out of ammunition, you could let him fly another day because it wasn't sporting. But by 1915, 1916, as it really got down to a, a truly attrition warfare, no one took that, that chance, that opportunity. You, you, you shot and killed your enemy, and no matter what circumstances he was in. Eventually, 17,000 airmen were to die in the Great War. As if the fear of fire, faulty construction of their aircraft, and the enemy were not terrifying enough for the young pilots of World War I. Once they did run into trouble, chances of survival were slim. For much of the war, pilots were not issued with parachutes. Parachutes were too heavy for use in aircraft, and it's commonly understood that British air commanders feared pilots would lose their offensive edge if they had the option to jump. They didn't want their pilots turning chicken in a perfectly good aircraft by bailing out at the last minute. You know, if they're going to have to force men to go over the top in the trenches at gunpoint to make an attack, they don't want the pilots bailing out. So surprisingly, if they crashed, I mean, there was no way to get out. There was no, uh, there was no uh, escape. One of the great American aces flying for the Lafayette Escadrille before America entered the war, Raoul Loufberry dove out of his aircraft because it caught on fire. And of course he had no parachute, but he jumped out rather than burn to death. In 1916, German officials, concerned that their air crews were being outperformed by the Allies, called on the expertise of a young ace named Oswald Bolke. Bolke is a master, not only at flying and fighting in the air, but codifying the tactics that you use to shoot down the other side. In other words, he's a masterful observer of what he himself does. Pilots at this point in the war were taught only to fly, not to fight. There were no tactics or training schools. The deadly skies were the airman's classroom. With the help of another pilot, Max Immelmann, Bilker began to change that and became mentor and instructor to the entire German air service. What Bulke and uh, Immelmann uh, tried to develop was the kind of tactics that would allow victory, especially among neophyte pilots who did not have a lot of experience. Uh, their dictums are still used today. Bulke developed the concept, still in use today, of flying two aircraft in a basic formation. While one pilot engages the enemy, the other protects him from attack. Get behind your opponent without his seeing you. Yeah, tell me how his nose isn't on me, but I'm in deep trouble here. Okay, he's got about 50 to go with his nose. Okay, direction is. Okay, okay. Okay, he's pitched off onto me, but it makes starboard dog. And so you're about to get gunned. Make certain you have the advantage of height, if at all possible. Overhead, overhead, huh? I can't do anything about it. I got 300 knots. I got it. Keep the sun at your back so that he can't see you in the sun. F4 belly, left side, 10 o'clock. This would say once you join combat, always know your avenue of retreat if you're over enemy lines, if you have to get away. In other words, he wasn't one of these people who would fight to the death against great odds. He knew the name of the game was to get back, to live, to fight another day. I just knocked it off. I just knocked it off. I think we pressed him pretty good that time. Bilker and Immelmann organized the German fighters into units known as Jasters, or hunting groups. Among their hand-picked pilots was one, Manfred von Richthofen, later to achieve notoriety as the Red Baron. The Yasters were equipped with a new aircraft. The Albatross was built with a rigid, plywood-covered fuselage, providing structural strength and eliminating the need for an internal network of wires. The new aircraft was armed with two Spandau machine guns and a powerful inline engine. Von Richthofen would score more than 75% of his kills with various Albatross models. On their first combat mission in the autumn of 1916, Bilker and his men shot down eight out of 14 British planes without loss. The Germans were to wrench mastery of the air back from the Allies, but they would maintain it for only one more year.